Hi, you are listening to the Conflict and Development in Africa podcast. This podcast is for policymakers, governments, researchers, students, businesses, and anyone that is interested in conflict and development issues in Africa. On this podcast, we hear from experts from across Africa and the world. Your host, Dr. Michael Wangpa, will ask the questions you would want answers to. Michael Wangpa has an extensive experience spanning over a decade studying, researching, writing and consulting on conflict and development issues in Africa. Michael Wampa, uh, and I'm the host of the Conflict and Development um, in Africa podcast. Uh, today, we are going to discuss Nigeria's 2023 election, uh, democracy, and the political future of Nigeria. Uh, I am joined by Mrs. Aisha Yesufu. Um, Aisha is a renowned social activist and human rights campaigner. She is an accomplished uh, Nigerian social political reformer. A civic and community development crusader, public speaker and educator. Um, Aisha, uh, you have made uh, an impressive, already made an impressive mark in your consistent demand for good governance and fight for justice, uh, fairness and equity. And I'm very excited to, to have you on the podcast today. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, let, let me start by asking you, this um you, you've been you know prominently active in your campaign against bad governance uh insecurity and police brutality uh you know we are so aware of your many campaigns the bring back our girls or uh, the NSAS protests but there's a striking statement that i saw on your website it was very striking to me you said um death for me is not where you can no longer breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide Death is when you cannot speak in the face of injustice and tyranny because you're afraid to die. So this reminds me of a novel by Professor Wally Shoenka uh, that says, um, uh, the man died. The man died and mm -hmm. kept silent in the face of uh, whatever. So, but before we delve into these social issues, uh, social actions, uh, can you tell our listeners what um, inspired you and what drives your flinching uh, you know, campaign for social and public good? Uh, even in the face of threats and danger, especially when many others um, who have spoken out in the past or who are in the position to to speak out and influence change, you know, have, um, either kept silent or joined the oppressors. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much uh, for having me once again. Uh, for me, uh, I think basically the first thing is the fact that I've always been someone who, who has been vocal all my life, even as a child. Uh, I, I, I don't like injustice and I'll always speak out and I'm never afraid of speaking out. When I was, uh, before I was 10 years old, I said to myself that the worst thing any human being can do to me uh, is to kill me. And that it's not the worst thing because I'm going to die anyways. And so I've always taken all those beatings. Growing up as a child, you know, you're called a stubborn child uh, if you ask questions and stuff like that. But basically for me growing up, I grew up poor. Uh, my father lost everything around 1983, 1984, and uh, it was really hard. And I realized that in Nigeria, when you're poor, you're faceless, nameless, and voiceless. I would go to school in the morning without break, uh, breakfast. Coming back home, I wasn't expecting lunch. And there were so many people who didn't want their children to associate with us because we lived on the wrong side uh, of town. And there was so much bad governance. And I knew I used to be very angry at my parents and adults. And just like, how are you sitting down and doing nothing? why there are some people who are like destroying the whole uh, country. I was, a very, I was a very aware child, even as a teenager, I read lots of books and all of that. And then on my 40th birthday, I realized that I had become the adult that I used to, you know, 
uh, as, as a teenager that I was angry at, that I also was failing uh, other people by my silence, by just facing, trying to grow myself, my world, getting uh, financial independence, uh, um, helping the people around me. And so four months after my 40th birthday was when a Chibogas abduction happened and, and, and I did join the campaign for the rescue of, of Chibogas. So for me, it's all about the fact that I've seen the other side and uh, it's it's really it's really bad over there. It's really bad. I and mean, sometimes it, it, I get really annoyed when people try to romanticize poverty. There's nothing romantic about poverty. It, it strips one of humanity, strips one of everything that you, you can think about. And uh, you, you don't even have the, the rights to even think about your human rights or your dignity when you're poor. All you're thinking about is survival. And there are so many people who for them every day just put in food on the table for their families is all the advocacy that they, they can do it's all the rights they can they can fight for they can't do anything and so for me i always remember that time when i was faceless nameless and voiceless and and i, I would not allow anyone make me faceless nameless and voiceless again i will have a, a say in my country and i believe that as a citizen i have a right in my country to say what i need to say and no matter what fear somebody tries to put in me hey, we're going to die anyway. So it's better one dies speaking than one dies silent and hiding. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. That's that's quite interesting. Um, I like I like, I like like that. Uh, it's better to, I think someone says it better, it's better to die uh, than, than to be live as a coward. Uh, speaking of poverty and how you say that strips you of your humanity, in, in the last eight years before this, during the last um, administration, um, Nigerians were were plunged into untold hardship and, and suffering. And one of the things that happened in this concluded election was like a lot of people, um, you know, the, the election was one of the one of the most expensive elections we've had, and it yielded controversial results with uh, President Bola Um uh the flag bearer of the ruling APC party, which emerged winner. So we've seen where this results uh, have been unsuccessfully challenged by uh, Atiku Abubakar of uh, PDP, uh, P2B of, um, of Labour Party. But running up to the election, like I said, uh, you know, with the experience of the last eight years on untold hardship, you know, there was high hope. Nigerians came out in mass, especially the youth. There were high hope that Nigeria's political landscape might, um, might, might change. You know, uh, Nigeria had that hope because for the first time, the race was three-legged. It wasn't, you know, between uh, PDP and APC as, uh, as it had been since Nigeria returned to democracy in 1999. Um, also, there was also that expectation that um, the newly reformed electoral legislation would guarantee, you know, authentication of voters and also particularly real-time electronic transmission of results. Uh, but this was not the case. So wh what do you think is the impact of this last election on social relations and Nigeria's democracy? Uh, so first of all, what, what, I would, what I would put on record is the fact that uh, Abola Metinibu did not win the 2022 election. He actually rigged his way uh, into office. And of course he had the judiciary that has been so compromised to, to, to go on and sort of like try to legitimize uh, the rigging that had happened. We saw, with the 2023 election, Nigerians coming out and, and deciding that they were going to participate uh, in the electoral uh, process. A lot of Nigerians that he to had never participated in the electoral pro uh, process. Many of them, because of the new electoral act, believed that it was going to make a difference. And also the confidence and trust they had in INEC with the way that INEC, the, uh, the body that oversees election in Nigeria, uh, made itself to look as if it was uh, trustworthy. And so people believed in that and they came out. And at the end of the day, the mandate of the people uh, was, was stolen. The effect of that, I think we can already see it in the election that just uh, was done, I think about 72 hours ago, or is it 48 hours ago, uh, where there were three states in Nigeria where they had election. And you've seen that all the games we've had in the last like a decade or plus, has just been lost. We're seeing situation now where results are already written even before the election is done. So that's that's the impact 
of the rigged 2023 election. Many people said, oh, move on from the election. Why? It's already done. Let's leave it. Let's focus. Let's focus. Let's focus on stability. Accept the result the way it is. But what they tend to forget is that when you as when bad behavior is rewarded, it worsens. And so when you enable rigging, what then happens is that it's enabling a, a, a environment for people to read more, for people to use violence. And this is what we've seen. We've seen in the just concluded election where states where election day didn't even happen in a lot of places, but we have results that are coming out. We've seen situations whereby uh, gener uh, we are seeing over 90% of people coming out to vote, which is which is not possible. I mean, there is a place where I think uh, only almost everybody that is registered came out to vote, which is usually not not tenable in the system that we we, we have uh, in, in Nigeria. And so right now we've also seen a situation whereby the register the uh, the votes are more than the accredited uh, 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 voters, and so it's as if we've gone back almost two de decades behind where people will just manufacture their own results, their own votes, without taking into companies as people that have voted or have not voted. This is the consequence of it. And the other consequence of it is the fact that when people read their way into office, when people kill men to get into office and they are they are allowed to stay there, they are enabled, they don't give they don't give good governance. There's no incentive for them to give good governance. They are not going to do anything for, for the people. So they're just going to rule rule the way they want to rule they're not going to lead and they're not looking at policies that we uh that would be beneficial to the people they're just looking at things that will be beneficial to their uh, own self-interest the reason why the, the beauty of democracy is the fact that you, you have the opportunity to change someone but in this case they just feel they can't be changed because they will always force their way in there they will strip the people of their mandate they will take away uh the mandate from the people and this is one of the things that has caused a lot of conflict that people are not looking at people are sort of like say oh okay let there be stability you can't have have stability when there's no justice you can't have stability when you've stolen the mandate of the people and so when people's mandate is stolen and they feel helpless there are some of them that you know take take arms against the state and against the, their fellow citizens and it becomes a problem that we've had to deal with because one they believe they can't get justice in the courts they can't get justice with governance and then so some of them take loss into their hands and as we go on this are part of the things that we're going to see we're already seeing it just uh barely a, a month after the 2023 election how things are, are, are degenerated and of course you have the corrupt politicians who are there they continue to give uh, bad governance continue to create more poverty and at the end of the day they weaponize the poverty to continue to perpetuate themselves in office oh amazing uh, you said um so many things I, I was looking at um the elections that happened in Imo, kogi and baesa this were really really hard hard um shattering you know to see the level of um flagrant and, and blatant you, you know corruption and then abuse of um of the process and yes, but, but you've said so many things. I'll pick on one first. Uh, you talk about stability and justice. And this stability, uh, I look at it, I want to look at it from different layers. So externally, we've seen where external governments or external institutions have uh, it inadvertently or somehow uh, maybe legitimized this. Uh, the Tinubu government may be preferring stability over what could be, you know, the alternative if if it was to be. So, well, you, you said something very iconic. Uh, we can't talk about stability without justice. So can you expatiate on that and look at it within uh, the context of the external, external people? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we've had uh, is the fact that there's a whole lot of hypocrisy in the world. Uh, the international committees and also committee of nations. There's this double standard that happens whereby, oh, certain kind of elections are allowed in certain regions and others and they are not allowed in other regions. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a situation whereby people are killed when there's uh, um, during election. It's not acceptable in a whole lot of countries, but when it happens in certain countries like Nigeria, other parts of Africa, it's seen as normal. 
And so there's always that, oh, let bygone be bygone, just move on and let things be. But at the end of the day, more and more people are becoming secure because you have a lot of people who do not, who now no longer have confidence in the system, have no longer have confidence in the state. The state hasn't been there for them. It hasn't protected lives and uh, uh, properties. It hasn't uh, given them justice. And so some of them take arms against the nation. And you've seen a lot of people who have been in contact with some of these either terrorists, either armed groups and all of that in Nigeria. And they come out sort of like speaking on their behalf because they, they tend to see the fire where they're talking about their own grievances that made them to take this arms uh, against against the nation. In terms of the Committee of Nation and International uh, 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 Communities, uh, is, uh, is the fact that there is no universally accepted standard for free, fair, credible election. We need to get to that place. Until we get to that place, and a situation whereby when people get into office through rigged means, then that's a political coup that should be treated in the same way that military coup is treated. Because when you steal the mandate of the people, it's the same thing like a coup. You've taken away the power that they have. You've stripped them of, uh, of anything. And then if we have that hypocrisy where they are ready to work with people who rig their way into office, what of course automatically happens is that they will want to rig and rig their way more into office. And then we are talking about, oh, the region, there, there's a need for stability. You can't have stability because all of this rigging of election, all of this making the people uh, helpless and hopeless, all of this rigging of election has continuously made the region to be unstable. And that needs to be addressed. So let the people be able to own uh, to own their votes and let it matter. Let them be the ones to decide who they want to choose. For example, uh, the current person who, as far as I'm concerned, he's not my president and can never be my president, who is there, who Ill illegitimately got himself into office in Nigeria, right? It wouldn't have mattered if he was the one that Nigerians have voted for. So it's not about who is the person that is offering. If it was a free, fair uh, election, there was no rigging. Things were not stopped. Results were not manipulated, were not changed and all of that. And he and he emerged as the winner. Fine, would have all moved on. Then that would, that, there would be the president accepted and, and, and everything would go on. That's the choice of the people. And you must respect democracy because it's all about the choice of the people. But in this case, the system is subverted and rigged in favor of somebody else that the people had not voted for. And then you find that, that you know, when, uh, when it comes to that, even the within the uh, outside forces, everyone is like ready to like move on. Let's not forget about everything. Just go on stability over justice. And then but by the time you they keep doing that, what we now have is a more and more unstable, not just an unstable country, but a stable region, because that's what has been happening all over uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we see across Africa how right now coup are now becoming a thing that people are, are welcoming. And that's dangerous to our, our continent. Oh, you mentioned, uh, I'll come back to what you mentioned before, the judiciary, because when, when INEC, um, uh, when INEC uh, reneged on, you know, its commitment to, to conduct a, a free and fair election, uh, everybody said that the, the term was all eyes on the judiciary. So the judiciary mm -hmm. was looked upon as um, the last hope. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you were also in in, in the um, court of appeal yourself, physically present there when the judgment and when this uh, election that was um, clearly uh, not fair and clearly um, not not done in the right process uh, was uh, confirmed. Now, what I want to ask: if you look at even during the military era, we had judges that. We had judges like Justice Kadia Shaw that were even during the, they were the military era, they were really delivering good judgments and they, they were mm -hmm. justice of a, a good good standing. What has happened? What kind of uh, what's happened to the judiciary that we have now? What are the procedures of getting judges? Why has why why is that institution uh, not able to uh, mediate proper lobby independence? What, what what has happened over the years and how can we strengthen the institution? 
uh, I, I think, uh, so first of all, in the fact that the judiciary is the last resort of the common man. It's not even as to whether we saw it, but it's supposed to be the last resort of the common man. But unfortunately in Nigeria, it has become the plating of corrupt politicians. And what we see now is, is a situation whereby uh, the judiciary has made a mess of itself, has made uh, a mockery of itself. I was at the appeal, uh, appeal court, you know, just listening to the judgment. And if you were in just listening to them, literally, you could see they were speaking as if they were counsel to the uh, respondents and not, you know, and not uh, 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 justices. And the way the anger that they exhibited anytime they spoke about the petitioner, almost like an anger. Why are you coming to court? Why are you trying to come and prove that there was a uh, rigging that happened? So it, 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 it's, it's really sad where we, where, where we are putting ourselves into. And I think it, it's all about um, a, a corruption of the system, of the judiciary system as a whole. Even right now, what we've had over the years is that people do judicial shopping. So you want to, so you find one appeal court in, in somewhere, we give one judgment on the same issue, another appeal court in another state, we give our same judgment. You see somebody will leave an Imo state and go to Jigawa state to go and get a judgment. Somebody will leave Kano state and go all the way to Edo state to go and get a judgment. So it's almost like they, you can buy this and so they shop around and, and they get it. So the, the whole thing, the, there is that corruption that has, uh, that, that has happened in the system. And it even starts from how the recruitment of the judges themselves, how do they get in? We've seen a lot of nepotism. The last few, uh, I think, high court judges that came in, there was a, a, a bit of an outcry from people who said, look, most of them are either children of uh, judges themselves, children of uh, politicians or wives or or, or uh, uh, spouses of, of of politicians, or so one thing or the other, they tend they tend to do that. We saw a senator, Edith Bukachua, who was who was talking. His wife was once at the appeal court uh, president, and he was thanking her and also thanking her for allowing him to 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 come in and you know help to subvert judge uh, justice on behalf of his colleagues. And he could have said more until the the senate president at that time. Sort of like stopped him and said, "No, this is not the place to talk uh, talk about this." We saw, we've seen the re recent uh, just a, a justice of the Supreme Court that retired recently, when he was crying out about the corruption that had that had taken over uh, judi the judiciary. So, if you have a system where people enter corruptly, where it is not based on uh, competence, when it is not based on uh, merit, and people get in uh, because of the, who they know or who, who they are associated with. Definitely, there's going to be a corruption. We've had over the years where people talk about the fact that, look, most of these judges, a lot of politicians pay their uh, pay their bills, pay their children's school fees, or do one thing or the other, or give them money one, one way or the other over the years. And so when they come calling for favors, then they have no other uh, thing to do other than to, you know, give them those, uh, their money. They, they, they then have to give them uh, those favors. We also must understand the fact that because we live in a country where there's really poverty, Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. And in Nigeria, if you want to have basic, uh, basic life comfort, you need you need to be you need to be rich. Unlike other countries where 24/7 electricity is, it's not so. You don't need to be rich to have 24/7 electricity. You don't need to be rich to be able to drive a car to live in a decent house. You understand? Just earn your your living, pay your bills, you'll be able to get those things. But in Nigeria, if you need to have 24/7 electricity, you actually have to be rich. You have to have the your pro, your machine, pro, uh, your power generating method, whatever it is, whether you're using generator, you're using solar, all of that. If you want water 24-7, you have to dig your own bubble. You have to you have to provide a lot of things for yourself. And in Nigeria also, access to good quality education is dependent on the economic status of one's family. So even though even if you are a judge, based on what you are, you're a professor, if you don't have the money, your children can't even get good quality education. So that has made also people vulnerable and open to being compromised. And then if you have somebody who is paying all of those bills for you and you have to do something beside the normal salary that you get a professor the salary a professor gets in nigeria it's so it's it's so laughable that you're wondering how do they even survive how are they able to give this, their family decent life so these are some of the things that have worked over the years and so they have sort of like compromised the system and more and more as you go on 
more of the those like you did mention more of those justice they have either they have stayed on they were true to the calling uh, of, of the bench and knowing fully where what the judiciary should represent should be you know the last hope of the of, of the common man a good number of them are retired a good number of them have died and so more and more what we are having it's it's just people who look as if they they, they are they, they, they can be compromised because if a system brings you in that is corrupt there's no how you're, you're not going to be corrupt uh, and along the way so it's for us to be able to get it right we have to go back uh, to the basics and that basis also comes from you find that at most time people who have the computer's character capacity would not want to go through the bench because it doesn't earn as much. They would rather go to the bar when they leave uh, the, the, the law school and they are making their choices. And for some of them, you can't blend it because at the bar, you'll be able to make some money that you'll be able to take care of yourself. And even with the bench, for even some that want to get in, they are not allowed to get in because there's this gatekeeping that, that it's all, always been done. And when they get in there, it's always about, oh, how many years have you put in, whether you're competent or you're not competent, as long as you've put in so many years, you get to be taken, uh, you get to be chosen and put in those uh, particular places. So then we need to have um, a, a restructuring, a revamping of not just the judicial system, but a lot of things, a lot of institutions in Nigeria, and we are all suffering for it. And just to mention before I round those this point is the fact that the problems, and I've been saying this thing for a for number of years, the problem we have in the political with our politics and our democracy is solely because of the judiciary. The judiciary is the one that has not strengthened democracy in Nigeria because politicians know as long as they can do anything, and then that's why they always mock you and say, go to court, because the court is in their pocket. And I'll give you an example. In 2015, uh, there was, uh, I think it was 2014, right? There was, uh, uh, we had a new electoral act. And then that was what was, we now had card reader that was used in the 2015 election. And because of that, because of the fact that uh, people, you, you, have to, you have to be verified before you can vote and stuff like that. So there wasn't as much co uh, corruption as you usually, as much rigging as you used to have uh, before. It was minimal. And then we had a place where, it, I think that was River State. The election that happened in River State was crazy. There were more voters than what had been accredited and all of that. And they would go to the court and the Supreme Court said that the card reader was not admissible in the court because they didn't specify it. And that threw our democracy back. A lot of people that shouldn't be in office, whether people who have forged results, people who have uh, done one thing or the other, they get to the Supreme Court they get to the court and the courts affirm their election and put them there. So a lot of people that ought not to have been in office that had gotten in their way, they're, most of them got in there because of the judiciary. And so the judiciary has really done a lot of damage for us in Nigeria. We don't have an independent judiciary. We don't have an independent media. And so it's crazy. Institutions are not independent. Even the, the, the legislative arm of government is not independent. And so these three arms of government the weakest one among them, which is the executive, now in Nigeria happens to be the strongest one because they have money to use. And they use that money to compromise the other two arms that should have been uh, very strong. Good. Um, now, you've, you've said uh, quite a number of things, but they are all linked to one, the, the elephant in the room, which is the Constitution. Because if we talk about the, the judges, uh, they often refer to because they're not making these things in a picture. They often refer to the constitution. And we look at the constitution as well in terms of like, you know, everybody looking at the constitution was quite clear on certain issues like, you know, the FCT, issues about the 25%, issues about separation of powers. So my, my question is this, because in, in writing my book, when I was looking at them, um, one of the things that need to change in Nigeria for Nigeria to move forward, I was looking at the constitution as very faulty because it's a military uh, designed and military constructed document. I, I wanted to comment on and see how the constitution creates all of. Do we need to change the constitution? Do we need to? Should we have that? Um, is that base uh, faulty? Is that why we have all of these issues? What can you talk about that about the Nigerian constitution itself? 
with the Nigerian constitution, we need a new constitution if we are really truthful with ourselves. Before even having uh, a new constitution, I think uh, we need to sit down as a nation and have the Nigerian conversation. And that conversation should stem from the fact that is this, is this union working? I mean, Nigeria is over, it's over 100 years now. The, the amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorate and all of that, it, it happened in 1914. I think so we are about 109 years now. And uh, when we were joined together, and so there's a need for us to sit down as a people and say to ourselves, is this working? Is this what we want to do? I personally have always said that one Nigeria is not sacrosanct, but good governance, accountability, transparency is sacrosanct. And, uh, and, and a nation that works for everyone is sacrosanct. And so we must, first of all, look at what is it that will work uh, best uh, for us. And then to come and look at the constitution that says, it, what is that constitution that's of we the people? We have where you say in the indissoluble, in the visible, and why? Why can't there be a referendum where people are sitting down to say, if this is working for us, let's be together. If it's not working for us, can we find a system that is able to work for us? Can we have a loose federation, just like what they have in the UK? Yes, so certain things can bring us together, but we're also able to run our different regions on our own different terms and be able to, you know, grow, grow up from there. So these are conversations that we really need to have. And then who are the people that are going to have this conversation? And usually the people the, and the legislative arm of government. And most of the people who go there, they really don't care. They are only interested in what largesse they can get, what vehicles they can buy for themselves, what money they can amass for themselves for the next election and for them, for them to enjoy their lives as they are. So that's been a major issue. Back to that constitution is that, yes, I totally agree that we need a new constitution that works for all of us. There, is, there are so many things that are just too wrong because in Nigeria, we don't have strong institutions where we have a strong men and women, and that shouldn't be allowed to happen. For example, you know, just reading at the other time, the Chief Justice of Nigeria has so many powers concentrated in one hand. Why? The, the, the office of the president, the president of Nigeria has too many powers concentrated in his hand. He has the capacity to do so much. Why, why, why is that? Why is that so? But beyond us having a faulty uh, constitution, so yes, the constitution is a problem in its own way, but the interpretation of the constitution also is a big, is a big problem. And that's where the judiciary comes in. No matter what kind of uh, constitution that you have, no matter how clear it is, the, ju the, the judiciary can always interpret it the way that they want. And I will give you an example. When it came to the 25% uh, FCT, which is clear in the language that the, it was used in the constitution, whether we agree with that language or we don't agree with it, that's, that's a different matter. But the fact is that it was clear in the way it was written in the constitution. But what happened when they came to the interpretation in the court, I mean, they, they would say to us, oh, you know, the constitution is a living document. And so you cannot just interpret it based on meaning you can't use the literal meaning. And, and I give it and I give it to the judi uh, judiciary. Yes, when it comes to judicial interpretation, they, they have uh, they have the 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 opportunity or the advantage to be able to use whichever whichever interpretation they want to use whether it's the literal interpretation which says look at the words the way they are written and interpret it the way they are or the or they use the golden rule the mischief rule the purposive approach where it's like look at what what did they want to achieve when they were writing this so you can use any of that but the standard now what we have with the Nigerian judiciary is that where they have double standard the same constitution that we were told is a living uh, a, a document cannot just be taken the way it is when it came to the issue of uh what for feature that was done it was it was no longer a living document so you see we have a problem like the for feature is there but they didn't use it even though it's there in uh in, in the constitution if somebody has forfeited uh, some, uh, uh, anything what does it relate to but they didn't use it so even if you have a, a clear cut perfect constitution as long as you have a judiciary that is corrupt they can always interpret it the way they want to interpret it and when you get to the uh, supreme court that's the final say whatever they interpret good or bad 
it, it stands on the way, except in some very rare cases where the judiciary will come on its own judgment and overturn uh, its it, 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 its own its own judgment, which I don't know whether we've seen many of that uh, in Nigeria. So as much as it's not really, so I would end by saying that it's not really the faulty constitution because you can have a faulty constitution and be able to actually make it work. You can begin to have even interpretation that it's for the greater good, that it's, it's for justice, not maybe whatever it is that had been written. Because over the years, we've had this opportunity. If, for example, after 24 years, I think at this moment, after 24 years, I, and I'm saying this to also to myself, is to stop talking about that it, uh, uh, it was the military that handed us this constitution. Hmm. After 45, 44 years, we have a right to have rewritten this constitution. They're always doing constitutional review. They're always changing. We could have by now changed everything through the legislative arm of government, both at the National Assembly and the State Houses of Assembly, would have been able to change and give us a new constitution. So if after 24 years uh, they haven't done that, I think uh, we shouldn't even be blaming the military anymore. We should blame ourselves and also the people that we, uh, we, we sent to the legislative arm of our government. Our lawmakers haven't done what they, what they are supposed to do. I, I agree with you completely. Uh, looking at um, even the what is going on in America, looking at uh, uh, that our constitution is even based on the American model, and look at how uh, Donald Trump's presidency challenged uh, that constitution. But uh, like you rightly said, uh, it was it, it was the judge, it was the court, it was the judiciary that that has brought sanity or is bringing sanity to that situation in in America. So. Even as mature the democracy as America is, he is also facing uh, such a such a challenge. So I do agree with you that the judiciary plays a very very central role. But let's go, let's move on to more um, positive stuff. In, in this election as well, it, it wasn't all negative. There were some really really positive stuff that came out from it. One of it one of the good things that came out is uh, perhaps not just this election, but what we've seen in the last ten years with uh, Occupy Nigeria 2012, coming up to the NSAS movement, coming up to this election, young people uh, taking center stage in you know, becoming so political aware, and also women as well, you know, being at the forefront of this, of, of this drive and, and the social movement. Uh, I, I wanted to, to, how can this be properly harnessed for effective social change in Nigeria, the youth and, and, and the women? Uh, right now, maybe uh, a few months ago, I would have given you answer top of my head and there, but right now I'm stumped. Uh, and that's to say, because this disillusionment is one of the worst things that can happen to people. And right now, Nigerians are disillusioned, and rightly, they, and rightly so. So it's it's almost as if, are you telling a lie when you keep telling people to hope? Because prior to uh, 2023 election, Nigerians really, most Nigerians don't bother, especially the young people. But the NSAS protest, we've had people before, like starting from the uh, Occupy Nigeria, like you like, rightly said, coming down to bring back our girls' movement, NSAS protests and all of that. Yes, mm -hmm. young people, 2015 young people were very invested in the politics, they took part in it, and then... Uh, the person who, uh, who was voted in came in and became, and became worse than the person that was worse at that time. Just like what we are seeing now, it's as if Nigeria is saddled with, the, uh, it's always the worst that takes over from uh, the, the previous ones. And so mm. there was dissolution once again. 20, uh, the NSAS protest, what it did was that it brought a lot of Nigerians to the place where they understood how, how little government can be. And so, and they were mocked after the killings at the Lekki Toolgate. gate. And a lot of politicians were like, oh yeah, if you, if you don't like what happened, go and change us at the polls. And they took that challenge and they put in all the effort, did all the things that needed to be done. The things that we're taught to do, the things that were supposed to be done to get the free, uh, to, to be part of our uh, uh, democracy, elect the people that were coming. Yeah, at the end of the day, they lost that. And then with the, this recent Imo Kogi Bayesa election, a lot of young people are saying, no, they can't. Even though for me, I like, you can't give up because to give up is to self-defeat and for them to win. It's for us to continue. 
So yes, there was a lot of uh, good things that happened. And that's the fact I say to people, let's focus on that. So what I would say here would be, let's focus on the wins, the little wins, and go on from them. Let's learn from what is it that has been done. We've seen now one of the things that we all can understand is that the, 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 the political class we have in Nigeria do not have strategy. They don't have intelligence. They don't have any magical whatever they are using to win an election. All they do is the rigging and the violence. And so we must find a way to mitigate the rigging and the violence. And so if we're able to do that, that would be a win for democracy where people's mandate uh, will go on. And so right now for me is to say, to as much people that can, don't give up. For those who feel absolutely they can't do it, it's okay. You can take a breather. You can... Uh, take a moment away but just to say that the uh, because a lot of your young people blame the older generation and say they never did anything but that's not factual they actually did a lot but they got to a place where they were broken and they gave up and so the subsequent generation that came felt they didn't do anything and so that's the mistake that this current generation was never made no matter how much you try to break, you don't give up. Stay on and keep going. And one day you find out thing that will become a miraculous uh, uh, out, uh, breakthrough. Because history is very slow when you're living it. It takes so much. It's almost impossible. But then when you get it done, it becomes history. And it's just like in, 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 one, in one word, somebody can just describe something that took decades uh, for it to happen. So let them know, don't give up now so that you don't get to the, the next generation that are going to come in the future. We say that you didn't do anything because you, you actually did uh, do something. I think one of the things that we also must understand is that nation building, it's, uh, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot, a lot of time, and that we must be consistent about it and just keep doing uh, the the ones that we will do. Uh, there have also been people that have called for, oh, you must behave like the current political class. No, you can't. You you can't do evil and expect to do good out of it. And the system that bring people in must must be clean, must be legal. And so whatever we do, we must do it within the ambit of the law and get it in. The moment you begin to double and say, okay, because it's easy to use violence. Violence is the easiest thing to get in Nigeria. To buy violence, it's so cheap. There are so many people who are waiting, but that's not the way to go. That's not the legal way. To rig election, it's, it's easy, but that's the wrong way. At the moment you double in the wrong way, you too, you're, you're gone. You'll be tainted with that evil and you'll become one of the evil, or if not even worse. So no matter how tempting it is to do the wrong thing, let's and uh, uh, let's not do it. And I think in the speech that Mr. Peter B made, where he talked about the values they were taught, there was a quote, I don't know if I'm going to get it correctly, where he said, it's easier to do, uh, it is better to do the, is it the hardest right rather than the easiest wrong? And so I, I don't know whether I got that quote very well, but that's the way mm -hmm. we must take it. You know, let people not be tempted to also want to use the tools that are uh, 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 the corrupt political class are currently using. Let's continue to uh, to fight on doing the right thing and bringing and uh, having that system that we bring someone uh, 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 judiciously and bring, uh, bring someone in a, in a legal manner within the ambit of the law. Yes, I, I was going to follow up on this and ask you the final question. But before I get there, I, I wanted to just ask briefly, do, do you think there's a link between this state political violence with, you know, the general state of insecurity in, in, in virtually all the geopolitical zones of the country? In the southeast, you have IPOB. In, 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 in the northwest, you have the banditry, kidnapping. In the northeast, is there a link? Do you think there's a link oh, sure. between? Oh, sure, absolutely. There, there, there is, there is always a link. And uh, one of the things that uh, most of us we don't pay attention to is the fact that, look, the moment you arm someone and you've introduced that person to violence, it's very hard not to for the person not to continue that violence because the person now understands the power uh, that they that they have. When they when they when they perpetrate uh, the, this violence, and most times during election, uh, politicians don't care. They just get as many people as they can, arm them. They, for them, as far as they are concerned, the the end justifies the means. No, the end will never justify the means. The means is very important. It must be a legal means within the ambit of the law. And so when they bring in all of these people, and then after election, most of them are neglected. Some of them have these arms within their hands. And then, of course, they use it. Some of them are able to come together and co continuously use it in their different uh, ways. We had right from 
uh, in terms of things like Bakasi boys, in terms of uh, uh, non-state actors that were actually created by politicians themselves for them to protect themselves, for them to use. And then those this, this people went out of hand and, and, and they've continued uh, to do that. Another thing also, and I think which really needs to be studied, and they have to be that link all of this violence that we see, because politics in Nigeria is very expensive, yeah? And so people are the ones, candidates are the ones who fund their election. And so there, there, is, uh, there is, over the time, a lot of people who have said there's a connection between all of this unrest we have all over the country. So you talk about the kidnappings, the billions of uh, uh, Nairas that are being made, the millions of dollars, because there are even some kidnapping, they don't even collect Naira, they actually collect uh, a dollar. So all of these monies, where are they going to? And there's no hard that the Nigerian state is more powerful than them. So, and there is always a link, because most times people actually say that there, there are politicians who are linked uh, to all of these things. And these are sorts of money that can be used to win elections. Because you have elections in Nigeria, we are very expensive. Uh, either you have those that are doing vote by, even beyond just vote by, the normal electoral process are always very expensive. And in Nigeria, of course, people don't have that uh, mentality that you donate to candidate. They always feel that candidate is the one that is supposed to bring uh, their money in. So, of course, yeah, we've had even the, with the Boko, Boko, Boko Haram and all of that. There has been a lot of talk about, you know political connection, like with the former governor uh, of, of Borno State and, and, and all of that. So there is always that. And because we have a lot of politicians who want to use violence, and so there is that connection between them. Another connection also, I think uh, this is not part of the question to digress a little bit, is to say, which I have never looked at, but in the recent uh, things that have been coming out uh, after the 2022 election and the whole history of who Chief Bola Metin is and all of that is to say it seems as if there's a connection between uh between drugs uh entertainment and politics and so there's a whole lot there that's that's another whole uh area that really needs to be looked looked into because you see how this fraternizing between those in politics those in entertainment and this whole uh, drug issue especially even with the death of Mubad, uh the singer that died Mubad, and then the uh, what's the other one um i can't remember his name the other politician who was uh, sorry musician uh who was uh, he was ambassador to the drug uh, NDLE uh, and NDLE yeah, yes, Neramali, yeah, that's the name I'm looking for. So Neramali and all of that. So there's a whole lot of things, and you're thinking and you're seeing them oh with politicians, uh, you know, to, uh, together, and you're seeing even like during the NSAS protest, one of the person that we had caught last that people kept saying, This is the person that attacked them. Up to now, it's not uh, uh, has not been arrested. You find it among top big politicians, you know. So you find out what's that connection. So there's a connection all, all, uh, also in there. But yes, just to round my long rambly of say so yes there is a connection between uh the violence that we've had and the uh and the, the, the level of violence from, from non-state actors and, and politics that we've had since 1999 because what we had and just to give a context to it is that in that 1999 many people did not believe that the military were going to go away so we had people who ordinarily should never have gotten into power were the ones who ran for office. The people who fought for the democracy of Nigeria, they didn't believe that, oh, this military were finally going away. So they didn't, most of them didn't take part in the election. And so when we had these criminals and people who shouldn't have been in, uh, 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 in public uh, offices, get into offices, they, they activated a lot of armed, armed uh, people who sort of like protected their regime. And it's, it's been a long time since then. We've not been able to get that out of it. And it has actually gone out of hand. What is what is your final thought on um, the future of Nigeria? What how can we like you mentioned something about uh, uh, democracy that got me thinking uh, because I've been thinking lately about it. Should we have our own kind of democracy? You, you also mentioned about universalized uh, mode of election, but, but I'm thinking is that the right method? Should should we be thinking of having our own? Because what happens in Nigeria, my estimation is they are selected, not elected. We don't, we don't, I don't think we have election, it's election. So should we sit down and be talking about what democracy means to us? How do we fashion that kind of democracy? And what would that look like? So what is a like practical 
ways in which we can have the kind of democracy that that is deserving and that will provide or guarantee or ensure uh, governance to 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 everybody and then address uh, structural conditions. There is there, there is no kind of democracy that is going to solve this problem as long as we don't deal with the issue of rule of law and justice. That's just the problem. The problem in, we have in Nigeria has not been the type of democracy uh, that we, we, we have practiced. It's the fact that we don't follow the rules. The rules are not followed. There is no rule of law. There is no justice. Institutions are extremely weak. Uh, men and women are the ones who are controlling institutions. The, the security agencies, you know, they, they are under the control of whoever is president and the ruling party. They are not there for the country and institution. So whatever system you bring in, it will also be rigged and it will not work for the people. So what we need to have is to actually have the system and, you know, being put fixed and being put in place. And there is almost like the chicken and the uh, egg story. Who is going to fix those systems? You need people with that character and patriotism to that will take power away from themselves and say, okay, no, we will do what is uh, the best for Nigeria, not what to, the power that, that they, 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 can, they can have. So for me, whether I'm, I'm always one, personally, I'm always like, okay, the parliamentary kind of system, for me, what would probably might work better for Nigeria in the fact that it's less expensive. Why do we have bicameral, you know, legislature? What are they doing? What are they talking about? It's so expensive. We don't have the money, and yet we are spending so much on this. And in a situation whereby also uh, everybody voted in a par parliamentary system, okay, everybody, we are all voted in. Yeah, it's first among equal. If you have a prime minister, it's first among uh, equal. And even if you have like people, um, a ministerial appointments, they are from the the uh, the parliament. They are also voted for. So even if you serve them as minister, they go back and with their parliamentary uh, duties, they are there for. So it's not this what we have almost like a master kind of master slave relationship that we we have in, in Nigeria. Uh, you could also say, okay, instead of having a bicameral uh, legislature, let's just have the unicameral uh, legislation, let us have one and reduce the cost. But the biggest problem is that it's not all uh, until we are able to fix this, the way they are brought in. Because if we're talking about having that good governance, even if you have different kind of system, as long as corrupt people go in there and decide that if they are going to do the things that will support them, that is for them and not for the people. We won't we'll have that good governance that we are all uh, yearning for. And so that's the biggest effect. Just to round up and also say that democracy without education is a disaster. And unfortunately in Nigeria, illiteracy has been weaponized. So deliberately the educational system of Nigeria was compromised. This thing did not happen today. It happened decades ago. And the reason why they do it, and in some region more than others, is because when you do that, you are able to have a, a, a voting block that you can control. And for these people, having that voting block, so where they can control the vote a, a, a block and vote power, has been more important to them than, than uh, people who are not educated. And so there are a lot of people who don't understand what governance is, who don't understand what democracy is. They don't know the relationship between their lives and government. They don't know that government is supposed to do this for them, do that for them, and they've given up of their sovereignty for government to protect their lives and properties, for government to do a lot of things. They don't know that. And so with the literacy also, they are unable, unfortunately, they can't do it. And that's why I always say to people, the education that we have, it's not for us alone, it's for millions of people that have not had the uh, opportunity, the privilege to be educated. And also in Nigeria, yeah. religion has been weaponized. So that religion is being used to keep people down. Why, from those on the uh, Muslim uh, part of it, they say to them, uh, Oh, no, don't, don't bother about holding government accountable. Just focus on making heaven when you get to heaven, you enjoy. On the Christian side, they are saying to them, oh, just look for your own personal miracle. Don't focus on government. So there's, there's a symbiotic relationship between uh, the political rulers and the, and the religious rulers. The religious rulers need bad governance for them to be able to sell cheap miracles. Then the political rulers need the religious uh, rulers to keep the people subdued so that there's no uprising. But the thing is that with the way that the 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 the, the way that the political class are behaving, I tell you, sooner or later there will be an uprising in Nigeria. Just the way we never uh, envisage our uh, NSAS protests happening, this one might happen, and everyone can be a victim, and it can be violent because the ones of the revolution of changing system, the bloodless revolution of changing system, 
over the time they have sort of like sabotaged it have not allowed it to go on and if you have uh, people coming out so there are already people who are carrying arms against the country people who are angry at nigeria people who does their own revolution does their own protest they are all coming uh, against the state it's just that many people do not relate that to the bad governance that we have in our country and they think that oh nigerians don't do anything nigerians are actually doing things and that's why most of us can no longer go to our villages most of us can no longer drive free, uh, freely on the road. There are certain roads that we cannot travel. And even when we travel, we travel with so many prayers. But then we forget that God will not do for us what he has given us capacity for us to do for ourselves. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, I, I was really hoping, uh, I didn't want to you know, pack so much to talk about the education. I was really glad when you mentioned that because um, I, I remember from the 70s and the 80s, our education system was like world class i met um, a professor in uh, in boston in 2014 who was uh, a white man who was um, teaching at the uh, university of oau or buffalo mm -hmm. university in the 70s and then he could talk about how uh, the quality of education we had then so uh, you know then you see how the education system have i think deliberately been degraded and so i, yeah. I like how you able to link between the political class, the religious class, and intellectual class. So there, there is that co-option, that complicity between these elites to, to keep Nigeria where it is. I'm really happy to hear that. I'm, well, thank you very, very much for your deep and you know very, very useful insights into uh, the Nigerian uh, democracy, Nigerian election, Nigeria uh, politics. Uh, uh, this is very, very, uh, very, very good. I appreciate it. Uh, your insight and we are grateful to have you uh, on board. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, viewers. That is uh, Mrs. Aisha Yesufu. Uh, Mrs. Asha, if we say Starwat is a, is, is a very strong and uh, renowned uh, world class um, human rights activist and social activist uh, that has been fighting for good governance and public good for, for uh, many years. I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode. Uh, stay tuned uh, for more episode. Goodbye.